We've been walking, doing a series through Matthew chapter 5, and uh, it's not ending yet. It won't end anytime soon. We're going to continue walking through the Sermon on the Mount, because every time I read the Sermon on the Mount, I'm like, there's, there's, there's tons more sermons than I can even imagine. Um, but we're going to continue on. Last week we were in Matthew chapter 5, and we looked at verse 17 through 20, and we're going to stay right there and pause there for this week. And then next week I have a, a missionary friend of mine. We were at Purdue University for a few years and met this amazing couple, Brooke and Kevin. And so Kevin will be here next week, and he's going to continue with Matthew chapter 5 and talk about the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness that we receive through faith. I'm excited about that, and I'm also excited to hear about what they're doing at uh, Indiana University, Chi Alpha. They have hundreds of students on a regular basis that meet together. They have so many students, they've been thinking about doing two services on a, on a college campus, just so they can host worship for the college students that are loving Jesus, seeking Jesus, getting baptized in the middle of the, of the school campus. It's amazing. So I'm looking forward to that uh, next week, the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness that we receive through him um, from, our, from our friend, our brother, uh, Kevin, missionary to Indiana University, Chi Alpha. But today, we're looking again, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to focus in on verse 19. Last week, as we talked, we, we mentioned that Jesus, he shows up on the scene, and the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders of the time, they were hoping that they would be able to dismiss this guy, Jesus, because they saw him as a radical, somebody coming and, and breaking the commands, breaking tradition, and they were hoping to be able to dismiss him because he was just way too far out there. He was doing something he wasn't supposed to do. But Jesus makes this powerful statement in verse 17. He says, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. To make them complete. And not, lots of people we talk about this in our missional communities, we're engaging in this, and, and we, we focused on this, that the law was not a measure of action. Though we can tell when we've broken the law by what we do. When we do something, we, we broke them up. But Jesus starts the focus here on the fulfillment of the law, and he points to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And this is an important step that Jesus makes when he's talking about the law throughout his teaching that he's living throughout. And when we look throughout the New Testament, we see this as an emphasis. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. It says, uh, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might. You may remember Jesus says this. One of the greatest commands. That you should love your Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, with, and then love your neighbors as yourself. So those were the two. Why? Love is the linchpin to all of the commands. Love God. Be in communion with God. When you're in communion with God, when you're pursuing after Him, when you're going after Him with all of who you are, not withholding anything, all of these laws, all of these actions, they flow out of that. But it's when we, when the religious leaders of the time, they loved, like we said last week, some of us, I mean included, like that checkbox list, like that justifying thing, so I can do all the right things, but still miss out on the what? The union with the Father, with the relationship, with the love. So how was Jesus able to fulfill the law? He loved the Father and he loved us. How do we know this? Man, John chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus was in perfect union with the Father. He only did what he saw the Father do. Wow. Next week we'll learn. That's a really good thing for you and me. Because if he hadn't lived perfectly, if he hadn't lived totally submitted to what the Father was doing, 
then there, there would be no perfect sacrifice. But because he lived righteously before the Lord, only doing what the Father was doing, he lived a life that was perfectly submitted to the Father. I mean, no, I, I, I'm going to go, I'm like, I, I'm not there yet. Perfectly submitted to the Father, his will completely, all of his desires, that was, that was exemplified at that moment in the garden before the cross where he says, hey, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus fulfilled the righteousness of God. He fulfilled the law. How? By doing only what he saw the Father doing. Submitting perfectly to everything the Father instructed. He was in a love relationship with the Father. But he didn't stop there. How did he fulfill the law? John chapter 15, verse 13, it says this, No greater love is, sorry, there's no greater love than this, that one should lay down his life for his brother. Love. So when we get our checkbox list, last week we said we, we, we're really good at justifying ourselves. We're really good at following the rules. Hey, give me a list. I told my wife, I told the story of, of, of telling Rachel I love her, right? And, and I'd like to like do a list of things and if, I can't quantify, I can't measure love, right? Like if you know, if you're a good task maker, task list maker, you know it has to be measurable, right? And so when I just put love Rachel on my task list, it's hard. I don't know how, I, I need something to help me measure that. So I, you know, try to fire things and, and, and go out and do different things and I and I try to accomplish things for her and give her items and things I need to but I can do all those things and you guys know this anybody in a relationship you can do all those things but it doesn't mean you're in love. It doesn't mean it's done from a heart of love. But Jesus said I went all the way to the cross. I did this because I love you. Deuteronomy chapter six again. You love your Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your might. So how does Jesus fulfill the law through his love? We find this in Romans chapter 5. Again, that he was perfectly and completely submitted to the Father, and he gave his life for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that... The, him dying on the cross was a demonstration of that love. Let's go a step further. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Jesus demonstrated sold out love for the Father. He demonstrated sold out love for each one of us. Dying to self for the honor of God the Father. And this is what he requires of us. That we would have that same heart to say, you know what? I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to be sold out for the way of the Father and for others. And that's what this Saturday is all about, is demonstrating this sold out love. I'm going to take my Saturday afternoon and I'm going to be out in the sun and I'm just going to serve. Yes, because Jesus fulfilled the law by loving us, even to the point of death. As I mentioned, the religious leaders were hoping to dismiss Jesus' teaching as outside of the law. However, Jesus fulfilled the law completely by focusing on the guiding command. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. In this you fulfill the law. And we come to our text for today. Jesus gives us a warning. How many like to be warned? Yeah. Some people like to be warned. That's good. 
Some of the things, sometimes I think warnings are crazy in America, but never get a hot cup of coffee from McDonald's. Hot, no. um, warnings are good. There's a, there's, a, there's a teaching principle. Warnings are good. Hearing the voice of God is a good thing. Yes. Okay. So when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that kind of. And sometimes after Sunday morning or after a time in, in the Word during the week or after a, a prayer meeting, all of a sudden the, the voice of the Spirit comes and it, it, it cuts deep. That's what the Word says it can do. It can cut to the innermost being of who you are. I want us to be a body of believer that says, okay, God, your warning, your voice, it's always good. Yes. All right? Because if... Conviction is coming to me if the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and all of a sudden something comes and, and cuts me or, or this morning when I read Jesus' words it's kind of like a warning to us and, and, and it kind of hurts, it gets me. It's like, oh, that touched a spot in me. I want us to run towards that. The Holy, the Holy Spirit reveals to us conviction. Jesus gives us a warning. Why? So we run towards Him. What is our tendency? We'll talk about this when we talk about being light, right? Our, our tendency is to like to hide, like to be in the dark. Oh, that hurt. I'm going to go away from it. But I want to encourage us this morning, if it so happens that the Holy Spirit convicts you, if he kind of nudges you, if he gets real deep and personal with you this morning, run towards him. He does this in love so that we can become more like him. Amen. Right? Our flesh, ourself, the enemy, we would love, he would love to just keep us where we're at. We'd love to just, you know, hide. You go and hide. Oh, don't bring that subject up. Oh, that's kind of hard to talk. Love the voice of the Spirit. We've got to love the voice of the Spirit when he brings conviction. And he also brings encouragement. But when he brings conviction, we say, yes, Lord, I know you. You care about me. You're concerned about me. You want me to live. And that's what his warning and his conviction does. So here we're about to read Jesus' warning. I came to fulfill the law. Amazing, Jesus. You loved the Father. You loved us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Therefore, he says right before this, I, I came to fulfill it every, every dot, every tittle, every strike of the law, I came to fulfill it. Verse 19. Therefore, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Warning. Warning. Red light. Don't Relax the commandments and do not teach others to do the same. I told you last week I said every parent, every leader, every individual. And this week because I was this week because I was studying a little more, I was like, all right, I shouldn't have even put that uh, positions of leadership or positions of authority. I should have said every Christian do not relax the teachings of the Lord. Amen. In the middle of exalting the right living, in the middle of exalting his fulfillment of the law, Jesus gives this grave warning to each of us. Do not teach others to relax the law by spoken word or by action. It's not okay. Last week, we mentioned this. Sometimes we get in this mood, we do something, and we're like, oh, it's okay, it'll work out. We use this kind of uh, qualification for different things that we know we're doing wrong. It's not okay, Jesus says. Jesus wasn't playing around about causing other people to fall and to miss out on the life that he died to give. 
He gets pretty serious with some of his words. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, it, it says this, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. This is the weight of the law on us. This is the weight of the Deuteronomy chapter 6, chapter six verse 5. Love with all that you are. There's no half-hearted Christianity. There's no halfway in. There's no, hey, I'm going to love Jesus on this day, and these days I'm going to live for myself and do my own thing. Why? Because at any moment, these things can be taught to others as the way to live after Jesus. One of the commands, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. Many times this has been referenced to cursing, right? We've heard, we've heard those lessons given. Do not, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. And, and when we teach these to young kids or we teach this in the church, it talks about, the, we'll talk about cursing, we'll talk about, uh, yeah, and, and cutting people down and using bad language and things of that nature. However, as I study out taking the Lord's name in vain, to take on somebody's name is to take on their identity. Denver just approached a judge this week, and he's like, Judge, I want to be adopted. I want to change my name. He said, well, what name do you want to, to change your name to? I want to change my name to Denver Philip Cole Castrova. Why? Because he wants to belong in our family. He wants to take on the, our family identity. He wants to stay there. When we become a believer and when we profess our faith in Christ, we are taking on the name of Christ. So I would agree. In many of the teachers that talked about cursing and those kind of things, I would agree. Don't do those things. I would say it probably falls underneath that command. But I would also uh, propose to you this morning that taking the name Lord, don't take on his name in vain, not understanding the weight in which that name carries. If I say I'm a believer, but then I act one way or I teach others to do something different, then I am taking that name in vain. And I do not stand for the name that I say that. We have to be careful. This is what Jesus is instructing us here this morning. It's serious business when we say we live for Christ, Amen. but we live a different way, or we teach a different way. And we teach them in disobedience. That's a good cheering moment. Great. Right? When we live in disobedience to the way of the Lord, to the way of the Father, and then reproducing in somebody else. We talk about this is a, a church, as a church we believe in discipleship, right? We believe in making disciples, and, and it's really good. Some of us are memorizing scriptures and meeting together and sharing with each other's truth, praying for each other and encouraging one another, right? Everything we do is making disciples. That's why I said last week I was thinking about parents and I was thinking about I was thinking about leaders, right? Because everything I do, I'm making a disciple. Every parent in the room says, "Yeah, I probably I see that. Yes, I agree with that." Right? All of a sudden, I, I, I react or respond to a certain situation, and one day I get a little upset about another uh, something that's going on, and then Denver. The same way, the same expression, gets upset about the same little thing. And I'm like, Ouch. I'm making a disciple. I'm passing on what I believe. Yeah. Right. This is why the warning is here. Don't lower, don't lessen at any point the law, the love for Jesus, the sold out nature that God asks us to be. Don't do it because when you do, it affects the next person. This is a warning he gives. He gives this also to, to leaders. 
James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many should become teachers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Don't lead others to become or towards disobedience. Don't lead others towards anything other than sold out love with all of who you are following after Jesus. It said here, they'll become the least in the kingdom of God. And those who follow and teach others to follow will become great in the kingdom of God. And I thought about introducing the sermon this morning and kind of like uh, like going towards our feelings. You know, that, hey, everybody wants to be great, so I was going to like work it up and, and, and work the sermon in such a way that, you know, make everybody want to be great. And so we're all going to follow the law, right? Everybody wants to be greater. It's good, you know. That's just a selfish thing, though. I, was like, I can't. I can't write this up. I can't do it. I can't promote self, right? But in, in, in here, I, I was studying it and trying to figure out what this meant. What What is the least and what is the greatest? Why is there some that you know? Do Do all of them make it into the kingdom? And it's just okay if we don't follow and teach the right things, and and it's better if we did uh, follow the right things and teach the right things. That's not, it doesn't. It doesn't fit, though. There's many commentators out there, I promise you I saw a few, that were like, and, you know, that's how it works. It's like, hey, you're, at least you're still in the kingdom. <laughs> I'll propose to you that is not what Jesus is talking about. Right. To be least in the kingdom is to be not in the kingdom. So if we want to be people who are in the kingdom, the only option for us is sold out, radical, dying to yeah. self, life living, love for Jesus. Yeah. And to teach others to do the same. Yeah. And instruct our kids. And to follow after our kids. And, and, and to teach our, our co-workers and to teach our neighbors. And to show our neighbors, hey, this is what it means to take on the name of Christ. You can follow my example. It's okay. Sometimes I want to say, it's not okay, don't, don't do that. That was not Jesus. That wasn't Jesus in me. <laughs> and it's okay to point that way, too. Yeah. I do that consistently. Remember, that wasn't Jesus. Oh, that, that kind of was Jesus. Follow that. That's all right. Yeah. Verse 6. Verse 7. Verse 8. Verse 9. I wrote this down multiple times. Don't teach, don't do, don't show anything short of an all-out love for God. It's not okay. Talk about the last week. We justify our actions. We justify our behaviors. We justify our trends. We justify our habits. We justify what we want. We, it's okay. God loves me. He wants the best life for me. It's okay if I enjoy this moment. Andrew, stop preaching this way. I can just enjoy us. Weekend. <laughs> Sunday for the believers is a time for us to gather together as a body of Christ. Sunday is not just the second weekend day. It's a day of worship. Alright, I'll read some words. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 19 this morning. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the certain so, sorry, through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us do whatever we want, go our own way, feed our flesh, love our habits, not pray together, not worship. <laughs> it took me a while to laugh. 
Because we have one, this is verse 19 and 20, because we have one that fulfilled the law, because we have one that went all the way to the cross, because we have one that has now made a way for us to enter into the very throne room of God, let us, what? Let us draw near with the true heart, full of assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed pure water. Let us go do our own thing. No, verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. Another thing we should be doing, verse 24, and let us consider how we could stir one another up to love and to good works. Verse 25, not neglect meeting together as it is a habit of some, but of encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Romans says this, because we have grace, should we keep on sinning? No! Right? Because Jesus has fulfilled the law, does that mean I get a free pass and I can enjoy my habits and do whatever I want? No! Let us draw near. Let us push on. Let us show how much we love by following to every dot, to every tittle, to every cross. Let's read on. Verse 26. For if we go on sending deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery, and fury of fire that it will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, back to Matthew chapter 5, dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, another warning. It's a warning and echoing from Matthew chapter 5. It says this, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Andrew, why are you not skipping over these hard passages? <laughs> because when I read Matthew, the, the Sermon on the Mount again, I said, Man, these are hard hitting. But it's what Jesus spoke. A warning. What should we do? Because we have one that fulfilled the law, we should move towards the Father. We should Deuteronomy chapter uh, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter six. We should love the Lord God with all of who we are, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. We should be pressing towards Him. We should be saying, what more can we give? What more ways can we serve? What more ways can we die? How can we live for you? The God, how can I show my love for you? Why? Because if we don't, chapter 5, it teaches others. It's okay to lessen the law. My prayer is that God's grace would cover me in such a way yeah. that I would always demonstrate to others what it means to be full of love for my Heavenly Father, for His glory. And I pray the same way for the body of believers here, for each one of you. I know your names. It's awesome. We're a small enough church. I can call out on God's behalf for you that you would also live completely sold out for Him because there's no other way. If Jesus showed us the way, what is the way? The way is to the cross. The way is for love, fully submitted to the Father. There's no other way than sold out Christianity, sold out God, whatever you want. To do. <coughs> we are called to be all, to die to Christ. Like Christ died for us.
back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, because he has accomplished the law, because he's come to, to fulfill the law, because he could abolish it, but he's upholding this sold out life for the Father, whoever relaxes one of the least of, the least of these commanders or teach others to do the same will be called the least. They will be called the outsider. They will be called not in the kingdom of, of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This morning, I would propose to you to check your love. And this morning, I would, I would even set up the song list. It is awesome every time it happens. But we all belt it out with all that was within us. That we love you, Lord. My soul loves you, Lord. Now we have a moment after our warning from Jesus to check that love. Do I love the Lord? Just as Jesus did. He loved the Lord. He loved the Father with all that was in him. He was willing to submit all of his life. He was willing to die to self all the way to the point of the cross. Are you willing to do the same? Do you have that same love? And if not, the beautiful thing about God is that He is a God that is full of grace and He desires to give you exactly what you need. That's right. So when I find myself in the position, this is why I said we we'll need to learn to love His conviction. Because when I find myself in a position where His conviction comes, I, I don't do more. Right? That's exactly what Matthew 5 is telling us not to do, right? It's telling us, hey, don't be like the, the religious leaders of the day that made a task list and all of a sudden now I've got to do more so I can prove my love. No, it's to ask for, Lord, would you give me grace? Would you allow the love that I have for you to grow in such a way that all of my life looks like you? And he loves to answer those questions. Why? Because he opposes the proud. He opposes those who try to do it on their own. But what he gives grace to the humble, the ones that come before him say, Lord, I know I don't love you enough. I know there's things in my life that I love more than you. I know there's habits that I have that I enjoy more than you. I know I want to relax your love and your law in this area of my life. I know it. God, I need you. And when we come to him in that kind of way, he answers those prayers every time. So this morning, my question to you, or my ask of you this morning, is to check your love. Has your love grown cold? Has your love waned? Is there areas in your life that you have been unwilling to surrender to God because you love them more than you love Him? This morning, our example is Christ. That He loved us. And He was willing to go all the way to the point of the cross. And so this morning, he's asking us to die to those same things that we love more than him, so that we can run towards him. Hebrews chapter 10. Because he has done this, we should press in, we should go forth, we should draw near. And so this morning, that's the exact opportunity we have. For the next five minutes, I want to encourage you to ask that question. How much love? Where is my love? I want to be up here. I would love to pray with you. These altars are open so that you can pray or you can take a moment at your seat. So let me take a moment to pray. Let's respond to the message this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We love your voice, Holy Spirit. Thank you for those areas of conviction that you brought to us this morning. And God, I pray that as we respond to you this morning, that our hearts would be full of love. And God, we would be a people that love you with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all of our strength. God, as we respond, I pray that you would continue to show us grace. In Jesus' name, amen.